Lord, we are so thankful because we are just experiencing your presence in our lives. And we know, Lord, that uh, as we continue to study, we can give you all the praise and the glory. We adore you. You are an awesome God. And Lord, just confronting you, Lord, with this makes us, Lord, reminded, be reminded of our sins that we want, Lord, to confess. We can be cleansed and, uh, Lord, be able to be pure before you, Lord. We thank you for this uh, Bible study group. We pray, Lord, that we will continue to uh, listen with a, a view, Lord, to abide in your word, to continue in your word. And that, Lord, uh, once uh, this pandemic is over, we can still continue. And if we cannot continue, Lord, everyone here who perseveres will uh, find a way, Lord, to look for a group, a church that studies the Bible together, that, Lord, we can uh, uh, be true disciples of Jesus Christ. So give us a good time in the study of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, before we study, I'd like to praise and thank God again for this group uh, who uh, continuously uh, is faithful in the study of God's word. I pray that if we, of course, stop in any way that you will study on your own, uh, find a group on your own, find a church on your own, that uh, uh, you will grow uh, thereby. We uh, re are reminded of, of, of the words of Christ himself in uh, John 8.31. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Okay, So continue studying God's word. It is the way to know God and the way to grow. Today we will study a very, very uh, common uh, exercise, which is praying. Okay, everybody knows what praying is. Everybody calls on God. Okay, because God Himself um, expressly reveals Himself uh, in, in in creation uh, through nature. Okay, by showing Himself as a Creator. Therefore, everybody knows that there is a God, an awesome God that uh, we can rely on because of his power. Of course, he reveals himself where also? And in our conscience. Okay, so, and therefore, he, he reveals himself that there is a lawgiver, a moral lawgiver uh, that we are uh, accountable to. And therefore, we call on God when we do something wrong. Okay, so everybody knows and uh, <laughs> that there is a call on and we call on God. Everybody prays, right? Uh, uh, you say, what about the atheist? Does he also pray? Okay, I, yeah. am I am reminded of a story told about uh, the Richard Dawkins. You know, Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins was, is a current uh, atheist who uh, is uh, really refuting the existence of God. He has a book entitled, uh, uh, what is this? Um, God, the delusion of God, or the God of delusion. And he, one day, was confronting a live audience, okay, of thousands of people watching him, and uh, also live in live television, uh, when uh, one day he uh, was asked uh, a puzzling question that he couldn't answer, and then suddenly he expressed himself and said, Oh, my God. Okay, and I think that is very funny. Okay, an atheist calling on God, okay, because everybody prays. Everybody calls on God, especially when he's in a foxhole. Okay, when you say when you're in a foxhole, you are uh, um, against the enemy fire. And when you are in trouble, you call on God. Because when the outlook is bleak, everybody looks at the outlook. Okay, uh, and uh, in Psalm 14, verse 1, only a fool says, there is no God. Okay, so the natural man looks after God. And, but we will not discuss what praying is about by the natural man. We are looking at the theological definition or biblical description of what praying is. Okay, the praying according to the spiritual man, praying the way God wants. Okay, if you look at your outline, what is praying? Okay, uh, two things that the Bible says that the prayer is. It is a spiritual discipline, and it is also a, uh, a spiritual armor. Okay, when you say it is a spiritual discipline, it is a spiritual discipline to godly living. Let me read First Timothy four seven and eight. But reject profane and old wives' fables 
and exercise yourself toward godliness, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and that of, of which is to come. Okay. Joy, are you making me the host here? I'm the host, right? Okay. <clears throat> so when you say a spiritual exercise, anything to make you fit in the kingdom of God is a spiritual exercise. Anything that uh, makes the train you, spiritually speaking, to be like Jesus Christ, okay, is a spiritual exercise. Okay, example, Bible study, worship, acts of mercy, um, benevolent deeds, evangelism, missions, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, and praying is one of these. Okay, in other words, it will make you grow when you pray. Uh, it, it makes you spiritually uh, fit for the kingdom of God. Okay, so the, the, the verse says here, exercise yourself toward godliness. Okay, instead of disciplining yourself physically, which you do, the, the, the word here comes from the word gymnasium. Okay, you have to discipline yourself with spiritual exercise. And praying is one of them. You become godly when you pray. You're disciplined when you pray. Okay, and you see the word discipline has the same root word with disciple. Okay, in other words, disciple and discipline and praying are all, are all aligned in being a spiritual of discipline to godly living. Okay, if you look at the same passage in uh, the verse before that, in verse 6, it says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Okay, you see the word nourishing, and it refers to Bible study. Bible study is a very, very important uh, spiritual discipline, okay? It Because when you say you nourish yourself, it, it, it's, it's, the Bible study is like eating, okay? You eat is your spiritual food, okay? So Bible study is like eating. Uh, in fact, in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, a very nice verse, okay, like newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Lord or of the Word, okay? Now, uh, this verse doesn't say that we are like newborn babes, that, that, uh, that the Wah Bible uh, is just like milk, but it is the analogy here is focused on being like a baby. We should all be like babies, babies who desire milk. And you cannot continue life without milk. You are so dependent on milk that you will express tantrum if you don't get your milk. And that is the that is exactly what we should have the attitude of, of, of a newborn babe desiring milk all the time. That is the word of God. Okay, so Bible study is a very important exercise. It is like eating. Okay, uh, and uh, and uh, the scripture says here, uh, it is it is uh, it is your desire to talk to God. Okay, now when you talk about Bible study, it's like eating. But what about praying? What is it like? What is it like? Okay, scholars say that praying is like breathing, okay? Because we exist in an atmosphere. Uh, when you breathe, there, there, there's this atmosphere that puts pressure in our lungs, okay, so that you have to uh, inhale and exhale. And if you try to hold it, hold your breath, what does it do? Okay, you turn pale, you turn blue, okay? And same is true with with uh, with praying. When you try to hold the pressure that God gives you, because you live in an atmosphere of being a child of God, you live in an atmosphere of of uh, God's presence and God's grace. And if you try to withhold Him, okay, you turn spiritually pale. Okay, you are helpless. Okay, that is what breathing or praying is all about. Okay, now what is more important? We always ask the question, praying or Bible study? Okay, what is more important, praying or Bible study? Okay, both are spiritual disciplines, but they go hand in hand, especially when we talk about communicating with God. Okay, uh, uh, while, by, while praying is us talking to God, Bible study is God talking to us. So it's a two-way uh, communication. Okay, you cannot just keep on uh, praying and praying without God responding to you uh, in Bible study. And most of the times, sometimes, or many times, when you 
uh, when the word of God is being preached to you. Okay, remember, it's like what if it, what Hebrews 4.12 says, okay, it is like a two-edged sword. The word of God is like a what? A two-edged sword. It penetrates you. Okay, so so that every time, sometimes, or most of the time, yes. when when the when the word of God is uh, is, is said, sometimes parang ikaw tinatama, ano? Because God is talking to you. Because God responds through His word. Okay, so praying is also very important. Okay, because we of course have to communicate with God. Okay, so that is the biblical theological meaning of of uh, of prayer. Okay. Second, it is also one of the believer's spiritual armor. In Ephesians six eighteen, it says, "Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness for this age, against spiritual hosts." Of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Therefore, having girded with your waist with truth, these are the spiritual armor that the God has given to, to the believer. Okay, we're talking about believer. Okay, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod the feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which you will be able to quench all the five hearts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being what will to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my body boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. If you notice, uh, of all the armor that God has given us. Remember when you say armor, it is uh, against spiritual enemy. Who are, you, who are your spiritual enemies? Who are our spiritual enemies? Okay, three enemies, right? Uh, of course, the allies of Satan, the demons, are, are, we wrestle against them. Okay, it's not a, it's not a wrestling match with, uh, with our physical enemies. It is the spiritual enemies. Uh, the world is, a, is our spiritual enemy, the temptation of the world. And of course, the internal part our flesh itself is our spiritual enemy. Okay, and among these armor, which one is the the, the, the armor that, that is offensive? Only one here is offensive. The rest are defensive. It, it protects you. Okay, but only one is offensive. What is that? What is that? Okay, what is that? It is the word of God. It says here, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. That is the only one that is offensive. The rest is protecting yourself. But it's the word of God that what? That you can uh, that you can fight against anybody, against the devil. Okay? My, uh, Jesus Christ himself used the word of God to protect himself, to go against the devil who tries to, to tempt him in the wilderness in Matthew 4. Okay, so um, all are defensive except the, the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. Okay, now go, go to verse uh, 18, which is our text about praying. Praying is a spiritual armor. Uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, if you want to uh, break down the elements in this passage, it says praying always. Okay, this denotes frequency. It denotes frequency. Okay, in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, instead of worrying, pray. Okay, that, uh, pray always, because we always worry. Instead of worrying always, continue to pray. That will make you not worry. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Okay, we will uh, study this later, okay, about uh, continu continuous prayer. Letter B, with all prayer and supplication. This denotes variety, okay, in, 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 uh, in the book of, uh, in, in King James Version, it's all kinds of prayer, okay, or all forms of prayer. Okay. In other words, you can pray 
in any form you want. You can pray kneeling down. You can pray standing up. You can pray uh, uh, sitting down. Okay, different forms. It's because praying is just talking to God. But there are also different kinds of prayer. In other words, different contents of prayer. The elements of prayer. Okay, uh, you you've heard of the acronym ACT at Acts. Right? This is a good guidance for you to pray. In fact, I use this when I pray. Okay, A-C-T-S, Acts, Adoration. C is Confession. T is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And S is what? Supplication or Petition. Okay? Uh, we don't use P because it, it doesn't form a word. Okay? So Acts, uh, Adoration, okay, it starts with always adoring God. When you pray, Think about who God is. He's an awesome God. He, he is a, a God that is a, that is powerful and holy. So give all the attributes of God. Know and learn learn the attributes of God in the Word of God. And then knowing that who He is, you will turn to yourself, right? And then you will confess your sin, Lord, because of who You are. Here I am, a sinner. So you confess your sin. Okay. Now know that you are. You are, you are, uh, you are, you need his mercy to just confront him. And then knowing that he is so gracious to you, go to Thanksgiving. There's so many things to thank him for, right? Okay. <laughs> Quiet. Uh, so many things to thank him for. Okay. And after thanking him, then you can go on with what? What is supplication? Asking your petitions. Okay. Lord, I need, I need. My tuition fee, money, Lord, I need these things. I need, I need my medication. Okay, so that's the that the, the pattern that most of the prayers are. In fact, if you go to to the the model prayer of Jesus Christ, that's how it how it works. Okay, uh, usually the more mature you are in the faith, the more you have at the, uh, content in your ACT and your your uh, your S becomes so little, okay? Because you want to adore him first, you want to confess your sins first, and then you want to thank him first. And before you get to the end, which is supplication, you don't have time anymore, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, usually when you are a young Christian, all you do is just go through ACT and then start asking all, all you want, okay, which is supplication, okay? But that's okay, okay? It depends on on uh, on on uh, uh, what you are asking him at that moment, okay. So with all prayer and supplication, let it in the spirit. This denotes the Holy Spirit's power, okay. Romans eight twenty six twenty seven. Let me read. Like likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for us we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. It is the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us. In other words, sometimes we don't like to pray, especially in public or especially in a group, because we're afraid of what to say, that I don't know what to say. Okay, remember, it is talking to God. And if you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will intercede for you. The Holy Spirit will make you talk. Okay, because if it, if God sees your heart, it is the Holy Spirit that will make you uh, relay the things that you need to you know, that you wanted to say to God. Okay, so uh, if you look at praying, praying is directly towards God, the Father, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's all about God. Okay, he, the Holy Spirit is the one who intercedes for us. Okay, so when you pray, don't worry about your diction or your pronunciation or if you have an accent or whatever. Okay, remember you are talking to God. Okay, and it's important that uh, that uh, uh, what your content is is directly uh, towards God. Okay, letter D it says being watchful. This denotes vigilance. In Matthew twenty six forty one, it says watch and pray lest you enter into temptation the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is what weak okay remember this is an armor it defends you from sin praying it defends you from sin when you pray 
It's because you wanted not to sin. Sometimes we don't want to pray because we want to do that specific sin, right? Oh, I want to daydream of this beautiful girl. That's why I don't want to pray. Because if I pray, then I will not concentrate on this beautiful girl. So sometimes we do not pray because we want to continue in our sin. But keep in mind, if we want to, to get rid of the sin, try to pray and you will not sin okay? because it is a defense against sin. Letter E, it says with all what? Perseverance. This denotes persistence. In Luke 11 verse 9, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Okay. Uh, sometimes we are so proud to ask. Okay, but God is our Father. The reason why Jesus Christ died on the cross so that the veil will be torn down so that we can what directly come to God without hesitation. Now, this is not vain repetition. This is being persistent in what we need from God. God wants to be us to be dependent on Him. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, with all perseverance. Letter F for all the saints. This denote uh, uh, the object. Uh, I, I, me I mentioned here for Samuel 12, 23, because even in the older times, in the Old Testament, there is someone like the judge Samuel who, who prays for God's people. Okay? And this is, of course, very relevant at this time when you are in a church. It is, it's talking about corporate prayer. Later on, we'll talk about corporate prayer. Okay? It is important to be a member of God's family which is the church. You should be a member of a local church. You are already a member of, of uh, the, uh, the universal church. We talked about this in our, in our lesson about church. Okay? But you should be a member of a local church where you pray for one another. Okay? Uh, not only be concerned with your, own, uh, with, a, with your own issues in life. Okay? It's all about needs. Uh, I, my, myself, and me. No, it's about the saints. Okay, um, it's about the saints. So praying is a spiritual discipline. At the same time, it is also a believer's armor. Okay, now, second, why should we pray? Why should we pray? First, what is praying? Second, why should we pray? What is the, ne why are we necessitate, necessitated to pray? Okay, a few things here. Three, three, uh, three reasons why we should pray. Number one, it is commanded. Praying is a commandment because God wants us to communicate with Him. And when and it is commanded for our own benefit. The first one is for our own benefit. Luke 18.1 When ought, when men ought to pray, when you say ought, he should pray. And faint not. Okay, this is a, a, a lesson because um, you now when you say faint not, it's both spiritually fainting and physically fainting or wearing out, or losing heart. Okay, sometimes when we are beset with so many problems, we faint. We faint uh, physically, we faint spiritually, we lose heart. Okay, kaya tinutulog na lang natin, right? Okay, when you have so many problems, uh, you want just to sleep it off. But the Bible says, instead of sleeping it off, go to God, talk to Him about it. Okay? Uh, tell what your problem is to God. You're better off praying to God than sleeping. Okay, the reason you're praying to God is is because you want to talk to Him and and, and uh, you want to tell Him what your problem is. Sometimes we are we we wear ourselves out the whole day. Okay, and then when we pray in the evening, we're so tired, we do not finish our prayer. Right? Okay, you sleep. And haven't finished your prayer yet, so that when you wake up in the morning, the first thing that you say is "Amen." Your "Amen" is already in the morning, okay? Because you are so tired. Now look at Peter in this uh, in this uh, situation in Luke eighteen one. This was a what is a, a scenario here? Peter, James, and John were in the Garden of Gethsemane when Peter, when Jesus Christ was uh, about to be uh, arrested. Okay, he asked his uh, his inner circles to pray with him. And what did they do? They slept. Okay. And then Jesus Christ, of course, uh, woke them up. Okay. And told Peter, you, you should 
stop sleeping. Okay, I'm we're, we're gonna having trouble here. Uh, I'm going to be arrested, and you are sleeping. Okay, in uh, in Colossians four two, it says, "Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving." This is what we call anticipatory prayer. What is anticipatory prayer? Anticipatory prayer. Okay. Because many of us pray only in the evening after our day's work, after when we already have sinned, and then we pray in the evening and say, Lord, sorry, I, I sinned. Okay. Instead of doing that, pray in the morning before the day begins and say, Lord, I'm ready to face the day. Give me the strength to face the sin that I'm going to commit. Instead of praying in the evening when you already have sinned. And say sorry along. Okay, so this is anticipatory. Be ready in the morning and pray so that when you face the day, you will be remember, you will remember about God in facing your sin. Okay, sometimes we <coughs> we, uh, we we are not watchful. Okay, we should be watchful in our sin. Okay. Um we should pray in the uh, in the morning for anticipatory uh, and be watchful that we will face the day uh, to 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 be able or to be able to fight the sin that we will encounter that day. Okay. Now the next is to pray always. Okay, Ephesians six eighteen. That was our passage a while ago in First Thessalonians five seventeen. First Thessalonians five seventeen is what pray without ceasing. Okay, what does this mean? This doesn't mean continuously praying uh, because you can't do that. You, you pray, you, you pray, closing your eyes while driving. That is not the right thing to do. Okay, you stop some working and not work because it says the Bible says I have to continue or pray without ceasing. Okay, when you say pray without ceasing. Okay, it means that you should have the attitude of God consciousness at all times. In other words, in everything that you say and do and everything that happens, you always put God in the picture. You always have a, 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 a time or a, a reason to include God in the situation. Okay, for example, if you see a clear day, Lord, thank God for, thank you, Lord, for the clear day. If you see a problem, a situation that causes problem, Lord, Please be here in us uh, during this, uh, this this pandemic. Okay, remember God is sovereign; He is in charge of everything. But God wants you to be to know that He is there always in every situation. So pray without um, without ceasing. Okay, I remember the story of this Bruce and bleeding Pharisees. You know the Bruce and bleeding Pharisees. Okay, they are trying to be true to the Word of God, literally. That uh, every time they see a woman, each Pharisee, they close their eyes so that they would uh, uh, not encounter this this uh, lustful woman. Okay, but what happens? They bump the walls because they they continue walking, and uh, they they hit their heads on the wall. Okay, that is not what it means when you pray with that season. It just means that you continually be in an attitude of prayer. Okay, pray always. Okay, so. Number one, it is commanded. Number two, it brings glory to God. Why should we pray? Because it brings glory to God. Okay? John 14, 13 says, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay, So prayer is a way in which God can display his power. Okay, So when you pray, God will answer it. Because it will glorify him to know that you know that it is the reason why your 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 answer your prayers are answered. It's because it is his 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 uh, way of answering the prayer. Okay, and so that when you pray, try to be specific. Lord, we need five thousand dollars. Okay, because if you are specific and you get exactly five thousand dollars, you will remember God. Oh, exactly. That's what I prayed for. God gave me $5,000. Be specific. Okay? So it brings glory to God. Number three, it works. Does prayer work? 
Of yes. course it works. Okay, let me ask you the question. Does prayer change the mind of God? Does prayer change the mind of God? Answer? Can you change his mind? No. Did prayer change the mind of God? Um. <laughs> Good question. Can prayer change mind of God? Uh, he, he's an all knowing, so maybe he knows the word. You know, uh-huh. oh. Let me tell you the answer. The answer is no. Answer is no. No. Remember, God is immutable. Okay, his plans are eternal. Okay, let me change the question. Does prayer change things? Does yes. pray change things? Change things? Yes. Yes. Not only does prayer change things, it changes events. Okay, let me read something here in, in, in Hebrew, in James 5.16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three days and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. In other words, God uses your prayer and my prayer to go around the means to the end. But the end is already set. God has already planned eternal purpose, his eternal purposes. Okay, but the way to go through that eternal purpose, God can use you and me and our prayers to go around that so that we can we can reach the end. That's how it works. That's how the Bible presents itself. Okay, so God doesn't change his mind. You cannot tell God, Lord, change your can you change your mind about no, it's it's already set. He's a sovereign God. Okay, but you ask him to 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 go around changing events, changing things. Okay, the effective prayer of a righteous man okay, avails much. What does this mean, a righteous man? Who is a righteous man? No one's righteous, right? So who is the righteous man? Jesus Christ. Who is the righteous man, huh? Believers, why? Because we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay, if you are a believer, forget it. Okay, you don't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Your prayer is not effective at all. First John 5, 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Okay, Psalm 34, 15 to 17. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Okay? The righteous people are those who have received Christ as Lord and Savior. Because in Romans 3, 10 and 11, no one is righteous. No, not one. You must be justified as righteous. Okay, we will go through a, a theolog- uh, systematic theology on justification. What is justification? Justification is God pronouncing you not guilty or, not, or, or declaring you righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember, remember when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, your sins will be transferred to Christ so that the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be transferred to you so that when God sees you, you are righteous. But it's only because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the whole, the whole uh, meaning or idea of the gospel. Okay? The gospel is God's plan of salvation. Okay? Through Jesus Christ. It is not through our good works because our good works are like filthy rags. Okay, so it works. Okay, prayer works. How does it work? Number one, it works immediately. Okay, Uh, in, in Isaiah 65, 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Okay, and I gave you... Uh, a situation in Acts 12. You know the, the situation in Acts 12 when Peter was in prison? Hmm. prison Peter was in prison and at that same time uh, the, Peter, the apostle Peter was in prison, 
the whole disciples were in the upper room. They were praying hard, okay, at the same time that Peter was in prison, okay. But while they were praying, God sent an angel to, to the prison, to the, to the jail, okay, uh, re, uh, remove the, the, the chain from his, uh, from his uh, prison cell, okay, opened the cell, went through with the guards, and Peter went straight to the upper room, okay, and then uh, he, he knocked on the door, and uh, the apostle said, Rhoda, can you look at who's on the door? They were still praying. They were still praying for God to, to release Peter. What happened? Okay, when, when Rhoda opened the door, he shouted, ah, he thought he thought it was a ghost. Okay, why? Because God answered immediately, even before they even finished their, uh, their prayer. Okay, so sometimes God answers immediately. Sometimes God answers immediately. In a delayed fat manner. Okay, Luke 18, 7. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Okay, the reason why God doesn't answer prayers right away is for us to be trained in trials, to be strong, especially when persecution comes. Okay, do not... Do not be impatient and and fight back. Okay, remember when you are a Christian, you lose your right to fight back. Why? Because in in Romans twelve, what does what does the apostle Paul say? Say, okay, vengeance is mine. Yeah. Says the Lord, I will repay. Okay, God has a purpose for not for uh, for for delaying his response. And one of them is, uh, is of course, postponing his wrath later on. So leave room for God's wrath. Do not uh, take the wrath in, uh, in you and uh, be ahead of, of God. Okay. So uh, respond or God, God answers prayers or it works immediately. It works in a delayed fashion. And third, it works different from than what we ask for. Okay, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. You know the story of Apostle Paul. Okay, he had a thorn in the flesh. He doesn't know. We don't know what this thorn in the flesh is, but it's something that disturbs him, that slows him down in his ministry. And what did the, he ask from God? He asked from God, what? Lord, deliver me from the storm. Release the storm from me. Uh, this storm from me. What did the God say? My grace is sufficient for you. No. My grace, just go on with my grace. Okay? And, and you know why he did that? Because Apostle Paul was has the tendency to continue without, without God's help. He was so confident in himself and not in the works of God. Okay? That's why God kind of slowed him down. Sometimes that's what we do. We work and think that we are doing it everything on our own strength. Okay, and sometimes God slows us down so that we will be reminded that we are working for Him and under Him and under His control. Okay, so He gives us uh, different than what we ask for. Uh, it works. Lastly, giving us more than what we ask for. Okay, in Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all than what we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Okay, sometimes there's a reason why God gave you more than what you asked for. Okay, which is good. Sometimes you ask for, Lord, give me $1,000. I need this uh, uh, to, to, to pay my bills. Or I don't have any work. Then he gives you $2,000. Oh, praise God. Okay, praise <laughs> God. You know why more, many, the, the a main reason that the Bible says that he gives you more than what you ask for? Let me read 2 Corinthians 9, 6. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Understand, this is a simple agrarian principle. Okay, in other words, the more you sow, the more you reap. Okay, what does this mean? Sometimes God gives you more 
so that you can give more. Sometimes God give you just enough because, hey, it's for you. You're using it for your own self anyways. But if you're a generous person, okay, you have you have you have this amount and you have an extra amount and you give to others what you have more, or you have what the, the surplus that you have, God will give you more so that you can give more. That's the principle there. Okay, that's why many uh, Christian philanthropists die giving more and more because they are generous because God gives them more so that they can give more. Sometimes we find ourselves not being able to give because we are not we don't have extra because we are just keeping it for ourselves. Okay? Remember, it is more blessed to what to give than to receive. So that's that's one of the principles there. Okay, so uh, why should we pray? It is commanded, it brings glory to God, and it works. Number three, what does God want in our praying? Which is really the title of our lesson, okay? What are the conditions of God so that he responds to our prayer? Number one, ask in Christ's name. Okay, John 14, 13, okay? In other words, you know, we always pray in Jesus' name. What does that mean, in Jesus' name? What does that mean? Okay. Parang padrino mo Jesus, guys. It's true. But what it means is this. You're asking consistently with who Jesus is. Because he is your Lord. Because he is your Savior. What you're asking for is what Jesus wants. I'm asking this because I know in his word, this is what Jesus wants and, or Jesus what Jesus will do. That's why you say, it's it's in his name. And it works because that is what Jesus wants. Okay. Next, asking in faith, believing. Matthew 21, 22. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Do not test God. Okay. Do not say, I will believe you give it to me, Lord. Don't ever test God. You don't have the right to, to do that, okay? You say, Lord, if you're really up there, heal my mother, then I will believe in you. Don't do that. Don't test God, okay? The reason why you are asking is because you believe and have faith that he will do it, okay? That's what Matthew, Matthew 21, 22 is saying, okay? Uh, the third is asking in God's will, Asking in God's will. I think this is the crux of the motive of prayer. Listen to verse John, first John 5 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay. So here is the here's the bottom line of prayer. When you pray, don't pray, Lord, this is my will. It will it'll never happen because if your will doesn't align with his will, why would he give it to you? Only pray according to his will. That is for sure how an effective prayer will be. It will respond well because it's his will. Okay, that's the crux of, of the motive of prayer. Okay, align your will to God. Okay, and when you know what God's will is in your life and you will delight in the will of God, Someday, somehow, what your will is aligns with the will of God, then you will have the same will. Example, in, 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 in Psalm 37, 4, what does it say? Delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So that whatever you desire now, because you desire the will of God, it will become your desire as well. It will become your will as well. So that whatever you pray because it is your will, and you know it's also the will of God, it's a sure thing. Right? Okay. So what does God want in our praying? Asking in Christ's name, asking in faith, believing, asking in God's will, and of course, number four, asking with a what? Pure heart. Pure heart. James 5, 16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Okay, don't ask with sin in your heart. Don't pray for impurity to happen. Don't pray like, like something bad will happen and you want God to be part of it. 
Say like God is your partner in crime. Lord, can you help me cheat in my ITR that I will not be caught? Nah. No, wrong. You can't God will not answer that. Okay. Ask with a pure heart, James 5.16. And of course, ask it with earnestness. Okay, this is the persistence in prayer. Okay, uh, this was our sermon last week in our, in our church, or two weeks ago, I guess. Luke 11, 5 to 9. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give it to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. In other words, you ask so that because you are persistent, persistent on it, okay? Uh, the question we ask now is this. If God knows our needs, even before we ask, why even ask? Yeah. And if God knows our needs, why do we even have to pray? Will not God give us our needs, us being his children? Why is the purpose of prayer when God already knows our needs before we even ask it? Answer. You, you have to ask. Depend on God. Hmm? Will not God give us what we need if we don't ask for it? Us being his children? If God knows our needs, why even ask? To praise him. Mm hmm Right. So we will depend on him. Let me you want to hear it. Let me give you an, an example. Okay. When I was no, no. well, was that when I was in charge of the college group like oh, twenty years ago, uh, Carlo was like three years old. Okay, my son. He's now twenty seven. Oh. We, we had a, a basketball a basketball goal like a toy, but it was already something that we, we adults play with. Okay? That's why he was good in, he was good in basketball. But but we have some college group okay, in, a, in church that uh, and always come, come to our house regularly. Okay? And they play with Carlo basketball. Of course, when they play basketball with Carlo, they let the, the Carlo shoot so that Carlo would be more excited about playing. Okay? But they, it, comes, it came to a point that I was watching them. Okay? They be, it became competitive. Okay, these college group were playing against each other. And Carlo was also there. They started to forget that Carlo was playing, so they became competitive. Carlo began began to be, be, uh, he, he felt that he was lost. Okay, mm -hmm. so I was just looking, and then suddenly Carlo just went away and was pouting at the corner. And yeah, <laughs> and then so I went to Carlo and asked him, "Tell me what's wrong." I exactly know what's wrong, right? But I was I wanted him to express to me okay what he felt so that he could be relieved and felt comfort, okay, telling somebody telling him, okay, uh, about about the situation. And then he released his his emotions. And exactly that's exactly what God wants us to do. God exactly knows what's happening to us, but he wants us to so that he would be an audience for him, an audience to him. Okay, so that when we when we relate to him, we become dependent on him. Okay, and when we become dependent on him, we feel good about it, right? Uh, so that is how how it works. God wants us knows our needs, but he but but he he wants us to to pray to him. Okay, uh, don't you want your son okay, to not not to ask help from you? He wants that, right? Every parent wants his son to be dependent on him. Okay, you don't want your son to to be secretive and not tell you anything, even though you know what's happening to him, right? Exactly, that's how prayer works. Okay, God knows everything; He knows our needs, but He wants us to pray so that we will what be dependent on Him. 
Number four, what does God not want in praying? There's one basic reason why, and this is what. What hinders God, or what hinders us from God answering our prayer? No. Sin. 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 All kinds of sin. Okay? That's why in Psalm 66, 18, it says, if you hold iniquity in, my, in your heart, God will not answer you. Iniquity is sin. Okay? Now, in John 9, 31, this is a, a very good verse. I want you to take a look at this. John 9, 31. Let me read. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. What does this, this mean? Does God answer the prayer of an unbeliever? Yeah. Does God answer the prayer of an unbeliever? Yeah. This verse tells us that he is not, he is, he is not in any obligation to answer the prayer of the believer. He only promises responding to believers because he is a true worshiper of God. Because how can you pray to God when you are in sin, when your sins are not yet forgiven? It's being hypocritical to God. Okay, the promise is only given to, uh, to, to a Christian. Why? Because your sins are forgiven. Okay, uh, and of course, you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But when you are in sin, even if you are a believer, we are told to what? In 1 John 1 9, what, is, what are we told to do? 1 John 1 9, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, okay. Even though your sins are forgiven, God wants us to be cleansed at all times. And the way to be cleansed so that God will respond to your prayer is so is is what? It's what? It's confessing your sin right away. So to a believer, when you sin, don't be a fugitive and running away from God. Okay, confess your sin right away so that you will be cleansed and you'll be right before God, so that there will be a, a fellowship and you will God will respond to you immediately. Okay. So here we see a few sins that even unbelievers or even believers do that will hinder us from, from, from getting an answer from God. What are these kinds of sins? Number one, doubt. Okay. J James 1, 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Okay. God knows your heart. Okay. If you doubt, why why even ask? Okay, it's an affront to God. Okay, you can you, you ask God because you know that God will do it. So ask God and not doubt. That's the point. Number two, another sin that will hinder us from getting our prayers answered is selfishness. James four three. What does James four three say? You ask and do not receive. Because you ask amiss that you may spend in on your pleasures. That's a problem. You pray, your utter uh, object of your prayer is me, I, myself. It's all about me. Okay. Of course, we ask God for our needs, but not because of our greed. You know what I'm saying? It's all, all about us. Okay, God knows knows your heart when you pray for others as well. So selfishness is a hindrance to prayer. Uh, number three, what else? Unconcern. Proverbs twenty one thirteen. Unconcerned to what? To other people. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. You know the golden rule, right? What's the golden rule? You do unto others, you do unto others. You also want others to do unto you. Okay. If a poor asks a little sustenance and you deprive him, okay, why would you even ask God for a little that God will give to you? In fact, we ask more and more from God. And then when you have more, in a, and here is a beggar that will ask from you, and you deny him a little. 
You say you might use it for drugs. But here's the thing. What's a little? Because you do not know whether he will use it for drugs or he might really need it. What's a little with a little follow up and say, talk him out a little about, quickly about Jesus Christ. It will what? It will, uh, it will be evangelistic for the sake of the gospel. Okay? And that little blessing that you give him, even if he, if he, if he uses it for drugs, will be reminded of your, of your, of your, of your love for the, for, for the unbeliever, for the beggar. Okay, so um, it's always nice, of course, to channel your giving to your church, for instance, because they know where it goes. But sometimes you have you have plenty of excess, and then you see a beggar asking for you. You do not know if they give it; they will use it for drugs. Try to give him a little and tell him about Jesus Christ. Okay, that is your 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 exchange, and maybe who knows, he will be saved because of this. Okay? Because your unconcern will, of course, not make you genuine before God. That's the problem. Another sin is what? Spousal. Spousal sin. What does this mean? First Peter 3, 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life and your prayers may not be hindered. Spousal sin. This is directly uh, given to uh, to men, to husbands. Okay. Uh, of course, this could, this could be also for women, for wives, but it is directly given to to husbands. Why? Because women are what are okay. the weaker vessel. Okay. W wives want to hear this. Okay. What is the what is the what is the duty of a husband in a marriage? Love your Wives the way Christ loves the church, right? And what is the duty of the wife to the husband in a Christian marriage? Submit, Submit to your mm -hmm. to your husband, okay? And uh, and of course, your husband, the husband is the spiritual leader in a family. Okay, that's why the wife has to submit. But if 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 nobody wants to to submit, nobody wants to give in. Uh, the husband says, "I am the I am right," and the wife says, "I am right." Who will first? Who should first give in? The husband. Uh, yeah. Husband always husband. Who should give in? <laughs> the wife. <laughs> the wife. No, husband always <laughs> outside the kulambuha. <laughs> the husband needs to respect what the wife. Rule what number is... one: the wife is always right. Rule number two, see rule number one. <laughs> that is what, wrong. What's the duty of the husband? Love Christ. I love the wife the way Christ loved the church. church. Okay. How did Christ love the church? He was willing to die for the wife. And when you say love, love is giving. It is not receiving. It is always giving. Okay, so when there is the reason why the husband should do should come first is because the wife is the weaker vessel. She is the more emotional one. She's the weaker one. She's the one who cries more. Okay, so the husband should give in the way Christ gives in to the church. Amen, my wives. Amen. Okay, so Jonah be the brain was more. Hindi nga kaya nga. <laughs> but remember, wives, your duty is to submit. Okay? Yeah, no, right? Ulit, 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 Pray when you are not yet what reconciling with your wife. You being a spiritual leader, you in in charge of your spiritual, you know, the spiritual what they call this condition in your family, and you pray to God, and then you 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 have your wife crying there at the corner. Okay, you don't even reconcile to her. Go and reconcile with her first. 
Yeah, that's also in Matthew uh, five twenty-five, something somewhere. Okay, so spousal sin is a hindrance to prayer. Uh, number five and number six is really for the unbeliever. Okay, it is showing off, a sin of showing off. Matthew six five and six. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love mm-hmm. to pray mm-hmm. in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in the secret will reward you openly. In other words, if you pray just to let people know that you are praying, that's not the right attitude. Okay, When you pray, in fact, God wants you to pray directly to Him, even in secret. That people will not say, Okay, pray not to show off. Okay, and that's what unbelievers do. We must not copy them. Okay, of course, vain repetitions, you know this. Matthew 6, 7, and 8. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Okay, God is not deaf. Do not be re- repetitious. And repetitious, that's like a magic magic chant. Okay? I'm not you, you, you memorize and you memorize these prayers. Okay, <laughs> Praying is expressing to God what is in your heart. Not shouting, you know, memorize chants. You don't even mean what you're saying. I'm kind of magic formula, okay, without meaning, okay, get, this is not how you pray, okay, this is different from, from, uh, from persistent prayer, persistent prayer is continuously praying to God what you need and when you, what is needed, okay, it is different from praying vain repetitions, you don't even know what you're saying, you just want to go through the motion, Okay, and God doesn't want this. This is what the pagans do, uh, according to Matthew 6. But how do we pray? How do we pray? Uh, Jesus Christ gave us a, uh, a good model of prayer. And everybody knows this. We actually call it what? The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9 to 13. Although it should not be called the Lord's Prayer. Why? Because it makes you think that it is what the Lord prayed. Okay, this should be called the, the disciples' prayer, as taught by the Lord. Okay, because when you say when you talk about the Lord's prayer, scholars, Bible scholars always point to John 17, because John 17 is the prayer of Jesus Christ to the Father. Okay, when he was praying in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that is the, uh, the 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 Lord's prayer. This is the disciples' prayer, but known as the Lord's prayer. So be it. Okay, but you know the, the the this prayer in Matthew six nine thirteen. Sorry, nine. In this manner, therefore, pray. What our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you notice, number one, one, one thing about this that, the, that Jesus Christ taught us is uh, pray corporately. What do you mean by pray corporately? If you notice the words here, it's not uh, my Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give me this day, my daily bread. No, it is our Father. Okay. Give us this day our daily bread forgive us our, our debts as we forgive our debtors do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one okay so the prayer is a corporate prayer it is praying for the saints and with the saints if you're praying alone you include them in your prayer who are the saints the members of the body of jesus christ members of uh, the fellow christians you pray with them corporately as a group. That's why that's how Jesus Christ taught us how to pray. That's why corporate prayer is very important. That's why we have prayer meetings. 
Okay, and when you pray alone, include them in your prayers. In fact, if you look at the prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17, he prays not for the world, he prays for his what? His very own. He prays for his sheep. Okay? So first pray corporately and second here pray with the right attitude. What is the right attitude here? If you try to break it down, he says, Hallowed be your name. Okay, another another uh, version is what? Another word for hallowed is what? Holy. Holy be your name. Remember in our uh, contents of prayer, the ACTS, it starts with God, adoration. And the very first thing that we should remember is that he is holy. He is holy. So you acknowledge God's sovereignty and authority first and foremost over all things. Now, when, when Christ said, hallowed be your name, he is focusing on the one character of God that was that is emphasized three times actually when it's repeated, when it is expressed as dead. Now, uh, in, in, in Hebrew literature, in Hebrew language, when you want to express or emphasize a word, you repeat it. For instance, amen, amen. <laughs> verily, verily. Truly, truly, right? That's, you see that in the Bible. okay? But there is only one character or attribute of God in the Bible that is mentioned in the, in the superlative degree. Because it is expressed three times. It is not God is... Is, is mercy, mercy, mercy. It is not that God is, is love, love, love. It is not that God is powerful, powerful, powerful. What does it say? God is what? Holy, holy, holy. Okay. Well, what do you mean by holy? What do you mean by holiness of God? Holiness of God, okay, from the word holy, it means you're set apart. God is set apart from us. In fact, the word holiness Another word for holiness is the otherness of God. Okay? He's set apart from us. We are holy because Christ is holy and we are the imputed holiness of God is given to us because of Jesus Christ. So only God is holy, but he is set apart from us. Saints are set apart. That's why when we study sanctification, we are being set apart. Really being holy little by little to be like Christ. Okay, But what Jesus Christ is saying is this. <laughs> When you pray, always be reminded that you are talking to a holy God, okay? Mm-hmm. That you cannot even stain it with any amount of, of, of impurity. You, you cannot desecrate him in any way with any trifling or trivial matters, okay? Because he is a holy God. Do not mm-hmm. include him in your, in your jokes. Do not include him in your petty talks and your petty quarrels in vain and uh, use his name vainly. Yeah. He is a holy God. That's why hallowed be your name. It starts with this. It's the prayer of Jesus Christ modeling it for us. And then the second, your kingdom come. It is seeking to build God's kingdom here on earth, not our own. What does this mean? When you pray, okay, do not pray. Hey. As if you will eternally be here on earth. Pray that one day the king, your kingdom will come because God's kingdom will soon come. When is this? There is a spiritual kingdom right here on earth right now, but this is not the kingdom that was promised. The kingdom that was promised was when Jesus Christ will come here on earth and will what? Will, will rule the earth. Let your kingdom come, okay? And you are you're you're excited about it. You are not. You don't want any delay anymore. Be, you know. You know the term uh, Maranatha, right? What does Maranatha mean? Maranatha, huh? Oh Jesus, okay. you come! That's what the prayer of John, John uh, the Beloved was in the Book of Revelation. He is excited in his death that Jesus Christ will come. He cannot wait any longer. Okay, is waiting for the blessed hope of the coming of Jesus Christ. You do not want to delay uh, things on earth because this is a temporary world. It's a cursed world. So uh, seek seek to, to build God's kingdom here on earth, not your own kingdom. Okay, that the kingdom of Jesus Christ will come soon. 
Second, and last, and next is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's seeking God's will, not your own. It's not my will. God's will is what we need and not what we want. And what we want is what we need. Exactly. Okay, so always pray what you, what you need. And then everything that you want is what you need. Not what you want for things that you don't need. Okay, uh, pray more for things which is God's will uh, and not your will. And then it's and then it says, "Give us this day our what?" Mm -hmm. And this your supplication, your petition. Okay, focusing material requests to just what we need, not what we want. You do not say, "Give us this day our our casino money." Okay. Mm -hmm. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray, you know, uh, every day for these things that you need on a daily basis. And then forgive us our debts as we also forgive our, our debtors. How dare you say, yeah, this is confession. How dare you say, uh, uh, how dare you not forgive when you ask for forgiveness from God? <laughs> forgiveness of our sins is in direct proportion to our forgiveness of other sins. Yeah. Okay. It is hypocritical to God to say, to ask for forgiveness of your sin, and you cannot even forgive your uh, your enemy. Okay, you say, how can I, I can, how can I forgive him? He doesn't even ask for forgiveness. What did you? They went to, to, the, to the people who were not even asking for forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they doing. No. You do not solve the, the, the sin, but you should have a forgiving spirit, right? And pray mm. that God will forgive him for his sins. And then it says, lastly, and do not lead us into what? Temptation. <laughs> from evil. Help us avoid all the situations in which sin will try to take hold of us. Okay, we hate sin. We repent of sin. Let us not love sin in any way. Okay, and pray hard that you will not fall into sin. We are some sinners who does not sin. Okay, we are all sinners. Everybody sins, but let us not relish the moment we sin and say, "Hey, air is human. To forgive is divine. We all sin. God forgives anyway." So. What's the point? That's sin. No. Okay. To err is human. Yes. To forgive is divine. So let's have the quality that God has, which is divine, and be forgiving as well. Okay. So this is a simple model of prayer that Jesus Christ has taught us. It's a very effective prayer. It is simple but comprehensive. It doesn't need to have flowery words. Okay, you did not have to memorize some, some highfalutin words in order to impress people with your prayer. Okay, but look at this, it's comprehensive, even if it's simple. Look at the look at the contents. They have six petitions here, if you count them. Three are directed to God, verses nine to ten, and three are directed to others, verses eleven to thirteen. It's like the Ten Commandments, right? What are the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments, four are directed to God and six are directed to, uh, to doing it for others. Okay? So it is like, like the Ten Commandments, which is the commandments of Jesus Christ. The summary of it is love. Okay, Jesse, I'm going to answer the question you were asking before. Is it about love? Love is very important. Although this is the kind of love, which is a supernatural kind of love. Okay, I remember in uh, 1 Corinthians thirteen thirteen. if you know the, the chapter about love, 1 Corinthians 13, in last verse, it says, And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of, of these is what? Love. Why do you think it is the greatest? Why is it greater than faith? Why is it greater than hope? Why is love the greatest? Okay. Well, because the virtue of love is eternal. Faith is temporary. Why? Because you only use it here on earth. Faith is trusting God for unforeseen things. When you get to heaven, 
You see things already as they are. You don't need faith anymore. They are, you don't need trust anymore because you already see the things that God has promised you. Okay, Hope, for instance, is also expecting something that has not yet arrived. But when you are in heaven, everything that, you, that was promised to you has already arrived before you rise. You don't need hope anymore. You don't need faith. You don't need hope. But we still need love. And it continues in heaven. And when we continue to God, talking to God in love, that is the very virtue in prayer. Okay, the reason why we pray is because we are what? We love God and God loves us. It's a love Amen. letter. Amen. 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 Yen lang. Any question? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Joe, quick question. Yeah. What's the difference between uh, debts and uh, trespasses? <clears throat> well, in in uh, in Romans thirteen, mm-hmm. we owe everybody. We we should not owe anybody anything, okay? Because when we owe any anybody anything, that is a trespass against him. Okay, utang utang. It's a, it's a term, okay? Even our sins are trespasses. Even our sins are debts. We are debtors oh. to them. Okay? Right. It's an obligation we have to do, okay? But well, there's only one thing that we should owe people. What is that? What does the Romans 13 say? What, what, what is we should not owe man anything? But what we should we what what should we owe man? Love. No. Okay? Love. Because love is the is the commandment that tells us that we should not owe anything. So when you trespass and when you when you have debts, it's the same meaning. It's all about sin. It talks about sin. Let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray and thank you, Lord, for uh, praying as it were uh, our last topic. Uh, we know, Lord, that everybody prays, but it is the natural thing, not what you We thank you, Lord, because you've given us the Holy Spirit over to guide us the way that you want us to pray. Thank you, Lord. Just with your praise, bring us back to Amen. 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 Amen.